Aloha, and welcome to another episode of Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. I'm your co-host, Matt Johnson, today here with Justine Espiritu. As always, we're here every Thursday at 4 o'clock, except we are going to have some changes that we'll be talking about later. Uh, as always, we're talking to Hawaii's farmers, foodies, and those that are trying to make Hawaii's local food system just a little bit better. Um, as always, you can join the conversation by tweeting in at, at thinktechhi, and you can also call in by calling the number shown below at the bottom of the screen, 415-871-2474. Uh, Justine, who do we have on the show today? So today uh, we have Jennifer Milhoen, who is the president of Styrophobia. Um, and like we always do, we bring in interesting guests from different organizations and kind of looking at the food system from different perspectives. Jennifer has been looking at food waste in Hawaii and kind of looking at creative ways we can address it mm -hmm. as well as partnering um, with the food and farm industry to create some products that could potentially be revenue generating and again trying to close the loop on resources and amenities. So Jennifer is here joining us as well as James McKay. Thank you, James. He will be stepping in as Hawaii Food and Farmers host the All next right. three weeks to kind of mix things up and add a different perspective of, of the folks we're kind of talking to. So thanks, James, for joining us for right. this intern mm -hmm. position day. <laughs> <laughs> But so to kind of start, uh, get back to Jennifer, um, why don't you start us off with what kind of stirred your interest in food waste and how the kind of connections you've made to address this issue with farmers and what you've been working on? Okay. Well, I can, I can start out by talking about the general mission of styrophobia is um, kind of two-pronged. One is that, as the name says, looking to get rid of single-use plastics, including styrofoam. The other mission is working on getting statewide composting. And that's, that's not intended to look like one specific picture, with the idea being that we try multiple models to see mm -hmm. what works best, mm -hmm. large scale, small scale. Um, and one of the main reasons we want to focus on that is because when we talk about composting in Hawaii, a lot of what we get responses of is like, that's just not going to work. Like, um, just sorry, sorry to interrupt, but when you say composting, you're talking specifically about food waste. Oh, that's a good clarification, actually. So composting, um, when you look at the regulations, definitions refer specifically to green waste composting. Okay. When you specify if you're adding in food waste, it becomes co-composting. Okay. Um, it's a very big distinction because green waste composting is considered a lot less um, pathogenic. Um, creating things like E. coli and salmonella, things that would be dangerous to public health. So it's not as much liability as if you're doing co uh, compost. Exactly. Okay. Um, especially when you look at the regulations, there's um, sh a lot shorter and easier uh, permitting if you're just doing green composting. It's called permit by rule versus the DOH co-composting permit. Yeah. Um, but the the intention is that we, for styrophobia in particular, is we want to create models and demonstration projects because a lot of what we run into is when we talk about ideas about statewide composting, they're like, oh, it's, it's not going to work. You have too many problems and like a lot of speculation. Wow. So the goal is that we create these demonstration projects to be able to say, that's not true, we have this data, or that's not true, this worked. So just the ability to demonstrate that things can work, and if not, why, so we can fix them. So interesting. So when you come in and say statewide composting project or facility, it, just kind of like the immediate response from Department of Health is that's not going to happen? Is that kind of the vibe? I mean, Not specifically from DOH. Um, generally... Um, when you talk about wanting to do large scale things like residential food waste pickup or like um, because that happens in other cities and counties but the reaction here when you and this is not one specific agency but just kind of talking like fielding questions from from different city and county and state agencies okay. the reaction is kind of like oh you know we tried that when you dig a little deeper it's like right. oh we tried it with like four people and they, <laughs> you know almost so I'm not, got to state yeah, line. <laughs> not, not, I'm not dogging them but like you know a lot of times you see that it's not Composting in general is not respected and considered a legitimate strategy for managing organic waste. Mm -hmm. um, it's being done for the city. It's being done for the city and county. Um, uh, Hawaiian Earth Products or Hawaiian Earth Recycling mm -hmm. um, out in Wai Waipahu, they have a green waste composting facility, very large. They have the city and county's green waste contract. Okay. So basically, everything that goes in the green bins goes to a large composting center in 
White Pahu. Okay. It's it's open open windrows, um, so large large rows of, of compost just, just that gets turned. Open compost. Right. It gets turned piles. with a, it gets turned with a giant a giant turner a okay. giant machine, um, but that's just green waste. Okay. Um, they they have a permit to accept some small bit of food waste, but it's very small, and if they wanted to, they could. They could transition to a um, in vessel system, which basically just it, everything's contained, air mm. is fed into it. Okay. It's it's um it's kept aerated, and in that case, if they decide to do that, they'd have to invest several million dollars in the technology, and then they could accept a lot of food waste. But they have chosen not to activate that permit yet. Okay. Because they don't have a guaranteed stream of food waste. Oh, interesting. So you got to have the combination of the permit, then you have to have the right technology, which costs. A few million dollars at a minimum More, to probably, put into yeah. place, but then you need to have your input, the right amount of product coming from whether it's restaurants, mm -hmm. schools, homes, right. wherever. And you also have to ensure if you're going to go down that that revenue that 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 business model, you also have to ensure you have the right trucks, which are very expensive. You have to have the right bonding, the licensing. So there's yeah. a lot that goes into creating right, a right. large scale composting system. But then, again, are we talking about creating a city run? or state-run facility or service, or allowing for private entities to kind of develop that? Or is that... When you say they... Or when you say a statewide system and you're talking about all these things that kind of need to be in place and the permits, is that a city-run thing or... That is... Um, the permitting itself is, is through Department of Health. Um, you have to... So it's a state permit. It's a state permit, yeah. Okay. Um, but you also need to have zoning clearances from right, Department right, of right. Planning and Permitting. Um, if you're going to have a large facility, you have to have um, permits, um, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits or exemptions from Clean Water Branch and Clean Air Branch if you're going to have... Well, like, is EPA get involved too? Or the, is there federal regulations, I would imagine? Um, I, I'm only aware of the state level and okay. the county level. Mm -hmm. um, but I would not be surprised if they were. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, but that, that just kind of gives you an idea of if you're going to have a large-scale system. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of because we don't operate on that level, a lot of the demonstration projects we're looking at are more small scale. Mm. Addressing like, okay, if there's millions of dollars that take to run these facilities, what does it take to run the smaller facilities that are lower cost, like have low operations and maintenance costs, they have low infrastructure costs. Mm. What are the ones that could actually effectively compost our food waste and our organics, but someone can get into without, you know, spending millions and millions of dollars. Mm. Um, so that's, and that's one of the things we did for the IUCN composting project. Um, World Conservation Congress. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, I mean, can you talk a little bit? So this was a, a specific project that you've been working on for well over a year. So with the World Conservation Congress, I was here in Hawaii. Uh, first time it's been in the United States. So it was a really big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, last month. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, explain a little bit about the project proposal and the, the process that you went through. Okay. So it all kind of actually started out. We were just it's a bunch of um, nonprofit uh, groups were just sitting around the table at Beerworks, actually. And, uh, <laughs> How much? Great. Yeah, 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 exactly. A little shout out to Beerworks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's where all the cool people go. Um, and Nicole Chatterson, who was very instrumental in, in helping create the Green Team, because originally they weren't planning on having any kind of team devoted to sustainability of the, of the Congress. Um, they were work. IUCN was working. Um, IUCN is a group that put on the Conservation Congress. They were working through Kupu, mm -hmm. and they're like, you know, we've been told they want to they want to make this Congress green. Right. Well, what can we? How do we do that? And so it was actually really exciting as um, as a member of the nonprofit community because normally when you have events or, or people that want to green, what they really want is like what can we tell people we're doing but not really do that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was really exciting because they really wanted to actually do something that mattered. And it, you know, and so it makes sense. I mean, it's a World it Conservation Congress, and <laughs> you know the IUCN. I mean, this is the main stage for addressing major conservation issues mm -hmm. in the world. So, I mean, it makes sense. It goes hand in hand. Absolutely. And what, what we proceeded basically was that we spent the next year, um, initially it was just brainstorming like, okay, what can we do? What do we want to address? We want to address plastic. We want to address water consumption. We want to address waste. Um, and, you know, that's kind of where I came in. Initially we were talking about zero waste, um, mm -hmm. which a lot of people poo-poo. You know, the reaction is that can't work. And my experience from doing this project is it absolutely can work. But you have to ask yourself questions about what you're willing to spend budget on, what you're yeah. willing to put extra effort it's into. It's a big endeavor. And you, have to, and you have to ask yourself, what am I willing to, am I willing to create whole new systems? Because it takes work, a lot of work, because yeah, um, yeah. you're shifting the paradigm. But we basically initially started out as awesome. We, we're only going to use reusables 
So we're, we don't have to worry about single-use items. So we just have to worry about the food waste. And that was kind of was like, oh, I don't want, well, we, um, the convention center is already giving their food waste that they create in the back of the kitchen um, to Ecofeed, which is, um, they, they get, they pick up from restaurants and events here in Oahu okay. and send that to piggeries. Oh, wow. Um, so it's, it's a higher and better use than landfilling. Oh, you can see it on the screen there. That's um, one of Kupu's pictures, a local piggery. Um, and so they're not, so basically what they're doing is they're, they're already capturing that food waste and not composting it, but, but putting it as direct feed for piggeries. Correct. And so it's, um, if you're, are you guys familiar with the EPA hierarchy of, of disposal preferences? Not as much as I used to be. Okay, maybe, so maybe I can refresh you. Refresh your memory. Yeah, you'll yeah, yeah. allow me to refresh you. For sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so it's, it's this little pyramid, and it's, it basically says the EPA and a lot of counties and states have adopted the same model. It's basically like, if you're going to dispose of materials, here's our preference, uh, here's a hierarchy preference. At the very bottom is, is landfilling. Okay. One up from that is incineration. Um, so okay. like waste to energy facilities like we have here at H-Power. Um, next one up is actually composting. And above that is feeding animals, feeding people, and then source reduction. Wow. Source reduction mm -hmm. being like, don't create the waste to begin with. Yeah. Um, so even though we knew that they were already diverting to, to piggeries, which is absolutely a higher and better use yeah. than burning or, in, or landfilling, it, it seemed like a very large opportunity, a very big stage to try something bigger. And you know, the conversation kept happening, like, who needs this more? Like, what can we do to support farmers? What can we do to create closed loop, sy closed loop systems on Hawaii? Mm. So I kind of, not volunteered the farmers, but I put out there, like, hey, what if we, um, um, <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> so we're gonna leave it okay. in suspense like that for just 60 seconds. So much suspense. And get more into detail about the kind of specific relationship and logistics of working with the farmers and kind of the benefits <laughs> they got out of the, the project or potential. Okay. okay, we'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September, and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Aloha and welcome Hi. back to Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. I'm your co-host Justine Spiritu. This is my co-host Matthew Johnson. We have Jennifer, president of Syrophobia, on today, and co-co-host James McKay, who we're gearing up to take over <laughs> for the next couple weeks. James, why don't you start us off with a brief summary and where we're leading into at this next segment with Jennifer? Well, um, the I final think, test. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. No pressure. I think we're just at the point where. Um, trying to find out the, the best use for the food resource, because really that's what fo food waste is, is a, re is a resource. So it gives you the ability to either use it effectively, which would be the higher up the scale of that EPA guy that Jennifer just referred to, or to basically waste it and have n really no value. L l landfill is actually a cost. So this segment's about waste to revenue. So it's how do we make the most of the resource that we're, we, we have the opportunity to use? That's really what the discussion is about. So it's creating a business model to make the most uh, of that resource in every way possible. So moving up the food scale, farmers need good soil to grow good food. So uh, as the soil is depleted or maybe you know, pesticides or other things, we want to use compost to regenerate the soil and all the active enzymes and bacteria and good stuff in the soil so our food locally will be better for us. So this kind of work's pretty important because um, if someone doesn't start this uh, a deviation away from business as usual, we're going to have the same old, same old. So it does take more work to do really the best thing and move up the scale of making the most of a resource. So it's, it's actually having the guys 
hands on the ground doing the job. So I spent a lot of time at the convention just seeing what was going on. Mm. I wasn't definitely focused on this side of the convention. There was a lot of other cooler stuff going on. Sorry. But, um, <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> Where do I prop it up and then <laughs> undercut it? This is important. So, but it's hard, like, seeing the guys at the convention center, they're trained to just throw everything out. They're not trained to segregate plastic from mm, food. And right. So, yeah, there was everyone just thinking, you know, it's easy to just put it all in one side and it'll magically sort itself out, which to some degree in Hawaii, that's, that's true on the waste diversion side. They do extract some stuff from our waste stream, but in this program, we really just want to keep the food or the organic material that you can compost healthily into one area that's not contaminated. So mm. I saw that that was a real struggle in this program. I mm -hmm. don't know if that's accurate from what you found. Absolutely, yeah. Going Definitely through it, but, that, yeah. you know, just the concept that you can't dispose of a plastic fork and it's going to grow into great soil. It just doesn't happen. So. Right. Well, so, so styrophobia is kind of has us in their mission and thinking about it. So tell us a little bit about that process of, okay, you said you kind of like peer pressured the farmers to join you or... <laughs> that might have been an over misstatement. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm kind of curious of how these kind of relationships and partnerships get established and then to kind of, you know, move forward with doing the systematic change that, that you're talking about. Well, thank you for asking, Christine. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, that, that's our job. <laughs> yes. Okay, good job. Um, so it's actually really cool because you you know you, you get to have these nice relationships with farmers just on a personal level, and you get you know you get to talking about the things that they're passionate about, and talking to um, this great group of farmers is called F uh, Friends with Farms, um, and it's a hui of farmers, and they basically come together and and they share resources and they share the the business burden of, of paying for things, but they also share the the benefits too. Um, so we kind of approach them, and and they before we even talk talk about this project, they were indicating that they were considering becoming like a haul, like a legitimate hauling service for food waste from, mm. from, from restaurants, like becoming an eco-feed but not sending it to piggeries, bringing it back to their farms mm. and using it in their compost. Because um, I, I think you guys have probably covered this at some point in your shows, is the cost of amendments, the cost of fertilizers, the cost of, of, of um, compost in general, like a lot of farmers have to import that and it's, it's a, a major cost for them. Um, we talk all the time about how, how, how do we bring down the cost of local food. Right. And one of the ways to do that is to bring down the cost of amendments. Mm. Um, so the idea, idea being that if they can, in their community, how far, however far they want, to, far out they want to go, um, they can pick up food waste from like restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, I live Nalo is very close to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they have they have a, a ton it's of a food. Restaurant ton of, in Waimanalo. Exactly. Yeah, they have a ton of ton of food scraps that they could just go from their farm, bring it back, and add it to a compost pile. Um, so they, they indicated to me that that was a goal of theirs, okay. and you know I knew the con the convention Congress the convention. <laughs> that's why they have acronyms. We'll just stick with acronyms. Well, <laughs> the WCC was happening, and it was it seemed like a good opportunity to test the model, which is kind of in our mission anyway. Is like yeah. create these models, and this was a good opportunity for like largest environmental con uh, conference in the history of the United States. You know, ten to twelve thousand people at one time, like. If, if we if we can figure out how, what's going to go wrong here, we can definitely scale it down for smaller events. So, I got told it was very ambitious, um, and it was a lot of work. Like I said, work for a year figuring out, working with the convention center staff, yep. their operations managers, figuring out when do things need to get picked up, what kind of bins do we need, what kind of mm -hmm. signage do we need. It's all it's all very important. And this literally, I mean, you started a, a year out. A year I mean, out. Yeah. A year out, and we worked on signage like what kind of things are going to grab people's attention, so they know where to put things. Mm -hmm. How many bins do you need? Do you what do you want to leave out? Like initially, when we talked about zero waste, we talked about not having any trash bins. Wow. You know, because we really because we're not going to have any waste, so we don't even need. Well, the yeah, trash it's bin. it was one of those things that like we knew there was going to be issues, but it was like the convention center is thinking is is a reasonable thought was like in the future people are com conferences are going to be coming to them going like we want to go zero waste. They want to be prepared for that. Right. So they're thinking like this is a good opportunity to test. And that's what the convention center's thought was. Yes. Wow. So they they were incredibly supportive. Um, their operations managers, like um, their housekeeping staff, like instead of getting um, pushback of like no we can't do that no we can't do that it was like great let's try it. Oh. And it was yeah, wow. really refreshing. Yeah. Um, the only the only um, naysayers we had were actually kind of higher up at the IUCN staff. It was like let's not overpromise. We got to put on a good event. And so that was the only real. Everyone else was super supportive yeah. and wanted to try stuff. Which, I mean, to a certain degree does make sense. I mean, they have a lot they're trying to do with the exactly. IUCN, so they got to pick and choose their battles. And it does, and, and that's, that was actually kind of, that intersection kind of um, illustrates the difference in priorities. For the convention yeah. center, though they were very supportive, their main goal is to put on a good event. Mm. You know, they felt like if they weren't prepared, like they, for certain scenarios, they might have, like, 
you know, forks sitting around or like trash overflowing and things yeah. like that. So they're worried about how the aesthetic, whereas mm. our per perception was like, we want to go zero waste. Like, what can we do for that? So it was, it was awesome working with them, but also seeing where some of the priorities differed. Yeah. Um, but they were very supportive. Um, and if I can mention real quick, uh, what, in terms of the goals of the pilot, initially it was food waste when we were going to only use reusables. But as the plan progressed, the, it turns out that we weren't able to use reusables like um, and, um, like china or, or metal forks or things like that um, because they're going to do concession. And so normally when they do buffet, they just use reusables like um, utensils and, and oh, plates okay. and things like and cups and things like that, and they just take them back and wash them. But when you have an event where it's you, someone pays for something and they take it away, they're worried about collecting all those those things. So mm. we were like, okay, we have to use disposables. And that was by no means the goal. Yeah. But it kind of like progressed into that. And we're like, okay, crap. Well, if we're going to use dis disposables, like single-use items, let's at least make them compostable. Yeah. And then the goal of the composting pilot, um, and actually here on the, on the screen you can kind of see that's like a small fraction, maybe a 35% a of the single-use Compostable utensils we collected over the whole two over the whole week? ten days, yeah, oh, ten days. thirty-five yeah. exactly. Yeah, and that's um, a big part of what styrophobia does, right? Is is distributing compostable utensils and, and dishware. That was initially when styrophobia started. It was a for-profit entity uh -huh. which distributed compostable products. Uh -huh. um, a few years ago, we transitioned to a nonprofit, so we don't actually sell any any products oh, anymore. Okay. And and ultimately, like we we want to go towards reusables, like we. We don't necessarily advocate for even compostable products because mm. there's still an association with waste created. Yeah. Like it's a single-use item, there's still going to be waste, even mm. if it's less waste than, than a regular plastic. Mm. But um, I just want to point out the pilot morphed into just getting the food waste to farmers to an opportunity to test if we collected the compostable products, could we compost it outside, like in a, in a regular hot compost pile yeah. at farmers? Because um, normally those products, like the, the corn-based polymers. And like the plastic cups, yeah, yeah, yeah. the corn-based plastics, um, they say they can only be broken down in a in a facility that's a, in like an in-vessel commercial-scale composting facility. Yeah. Um, because it gets really hot, like 200 degrees. Okay. But our thought was. Um, and that's always been a complaint of these compostable products. It sounds really good when a restaurant is selling that, but if it's just going into the trash can like a normal piece of trash, then it's not really doing the intent of the purpose of the it's product. It's not completing the goal, yeah. but it, you know, it, you are saving resources at the front end. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so our, our goal kind of became, all right, let's not only capture this and, and kind of document just how much is being created, how much compostable material is being created, but let's see if we can um, take these hot compost piles that are done by farmers outdoors, um, let's chip up all these all these materials, which normally doesn't happen at an in-vessel composting system. Mm -hmm. They just put them in whole. Mm -hmm. Let's chip it up and see if the increased surface area on all the products, is it allows it. That's an in-vessel composting system. Where is um, that? That's just that's something I pulled off the internet. That's, uh, that's not. So it's good. just an example. It's just an something. example. Yeah. It's not in your front yard right now. It's not my front yard. But basically, the the idea being that we test whether or not local farmers on a small scale could break down these compostable products without million-dollar facilities to do it. Because if they could, like let's say let's talk about I Love Nalo again. If mm -hmm. they have those fiber clamshells and if they decide to use yeah. corn-based utensils. Not only would the farmers be able to take the food waste, they'd be able to take the compostables as well. It increases their materials, but it also decreases the restaurant's material they have to pay to dispose of. And and that could be composted together then. That's that's, that's one of the things we, we wanted to test. Mm -hmm. um, um, so that was a goal to kind of test these two different lines of of compost, the, the food waste and then these compostable yeah. uh, one-time use products. Exactly. And, and, it's, and that's something that you, that there's a, certain requirements that you need to fulfill. You need to have a permit to be able to do exactly. this. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and that's and that was a big that's the big question mark is um how did it go? So these we talked <laughs> <laughs> We were all just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> we we've talked a lot about what the intentions were. Let's let's get down to the meat of it, like what actually happened. Yeah. So um, when I set out in the process to get the because like I said you have to have a Department of Health permit mm -hmm. um, uh, to do co composting. So in order for us to take the convention center's food waste and their compostable products to the farming to the composting site create a composting pile, we would have had to have that permit. Okay. Um, so I started that permit um, a year out. And mm. I, when I started, I had no inclination how long it would take me. It took me yeah. a year to write. It ended up being 218 pages. Wow. Um, and the reason being that there, in other states and municipalities, they have a, a tiered system. Like, if you're going to have a small composting system, you fill out a less complex okay. permit. You know, and as it goes up, makes sense. You know, it does make sense. You're, you're allowing for different size 
entities. But here, it turns out, and I, I discovered all this in the process, I had to fill out the same co-composting permit than Hawaiian Earth products had to fill wow. out. So a facility that's handling the, the organic material for the entire island, mm. I had to fill out the exact same application. So then did you kind of come up with the idea of this like tiered permitting system, or is that something you saw like after you started this, you're like, oh, how is this being done in other places? Mm. Is there like cities or states that you saw a good example of, it, here's kind of what we were trying to do over there, maybe we can... It occurred to me while I was doing it, and then I went and found examples. So just kind of like, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, what were so some of the good examples? Sorry? What were some of the good examples? What were cities that had... Um, you see it in, in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, kind of like the, the typical cities Those that... hippie cities. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of cities in Vermont, like a lot of states have the tiered system too. Um, it just, it just, it's common. It, it makes sense that you would have, you would adjust your permitting based on the size and the, the level of risk, basically. Because yeah. that's the Department of Health's job, you know, protecting public health, protecting health in general. So it makes sense for a large facility to have that level, but I don't believe it makes sense to have it for like a farmer that wants to you know, collect a small bit of food waste. And ultimately what happened was, you know, big cliffhanger, the permit yeah. didn't come through in time. So, you know, we prepared everything, this, you know, the signage, the logistics plans, the pickup schedules, everything was ready. Wow. Um, so it was heart-wrenching the idea of pulling the plug and just going back to, to throwing everything away. So the compromise we decided on was that, you know, we still pick up, we still collect uh, on the floor. There's still the, um, yeah. do we, I think we have the signs of the composting bins or the trash bins at the, no. Oh, sorry, I guess we got it. No, I guess we don't. Never mind. But so we, we only actually have a minute left. So if you want to wrap it up by kind of maybe saying what the, the next steps, if we do have these examples of a tiered system, is, is that like a mission you're taking on to, that, to, to adapt? Absolutely. We want to work directly with Department of Agriculture, Department of Health to, to adjust these regulations because you look at the regulations and exemptions, there's lots of opportunity to amend that. And I think it would have a much better system that allows for these smaller regional composting systems that I think would be better serving the communities than just a, just a central one. So um, that's something uh, Styrophobia is going to spearhead or that, that food waste group? Um, there's also food, food waste recovery hui going on. Um, it's kind of different, different interagencies, counties, nonprofits come together for food waste at all the left, different levels. Um, but that, and I think number, number one thing is too, is a huge value perception of, like James had mentioned, the value perception shift mm. of food waste and organics as a resource, not because it, the city and counties, sorry, the different counties treat it like something that needs to be gotten rid of, something is a burden. It's an expense. And we have to shift that perception of, you know, these are resources that we have an opportunity to benefit from. And I think that'll, that'll shift the whole conversation. Great. And James is going to spearhead that conversation <laughs> next week. So we're out of time. Oh. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for coming on and, and sharing your story and kind of what's next for that. It's really exciting to see that progression. I'm excited. Thanks for joining us, James. Pleasure. And we will see you here next week. Yeah, well, I'll see you myself. <laughs> <laughs>